if you need translation, there are headsets available and someone will be translating in the back. Um, sorry? Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, Alice can help me. Nani kama unahitaji kutafsiri Kiswahili kuna hiyo roho hapo mwisho kuna headset ambazo zitakusaidia kusikia Kiswahili asante Thank you thank you very much um, I'm going to say a short prayer before Kwesi comes up let us pray Dear Heavenly Father we thank you for this opportunity to come and hear from you we pray that as Kwesi comes up, may you please empower and strengthen him by your spirit. May you speak truth. May you speak a timely word for each and every one of us here today. May you breathe life onto the message, and may we be impacted and changed by it, not only here today, but as the week goes ahead. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Good morning. That was a good rescue by Alice. I think uh, Arthur will be grateful for a very long time to come. It's a joy to be here with you this morning. Uh, let me first take the opportunity to thank um, Sheshi and the elders of the church for the opportunity to speak. You have to realize that sharing, uh, sharing a pulpit is not something that is to be done lightly. And it is certainly an honor to be here to get a chance to share God's word with you. Now, for those who have been here for a while, you would recognize that we are in the seventh week of a series on tough questions. If you haven't been here, what we've been dealing with is difficult questions that you would typically hear within a Christian walk, uh, but sometimes also uh, from unbelievers. Now, why would we want to deal with these tough questions? Because these are the things that eat at our hearts and sometimes make us struggle in our Christian walk. And our goal is hopefully to delve into these as best as we can to prepare ourselves for the walk that is ahead so we can live as faithfully as we can to the glory of God. This morning, we are looking at the last question in that series, and that question is, hasn't science disproved Christianity? Hasn't science disproved Christianity? You would wonder, why would we even bother talking about science in church? But given the number of times we hear those two subjects being brought together, and the question being asked whether they can coexist side by side and effectively prove either one or the other, it means we have to find a way to address it. If you've taken a look through your Bible, depending on the translation that you have, you may find the word science in it. You may not find it at all. And in most cases, it's not actually referring to the science that we talk about today uh, in the translations that actually have it. So we are going to have to delve into some facts today, both in Scripture and to a large extent out of Scripture, to try to make this case. So you have to stay with me. Amen? Amen? So try to wear your scientific caps. You know, if you haven't taken a science lesson, maybe this might be one of your first opportunities. But the idea is that we take this adventure together and hopefully, at the end, we will come out with a conclusion that is biblically sound around how we answer this question, hasn't science disproved Christianity? Now, if you know anyone who is an atheist, an atheist being those that profess to there being no God, you would have heard this a lot. This is technically the conversation that uh, hovers around there being no God at all. So there are other religions that may believe there is a God, but a different God of some sort. Uh, but this question tends to come 
primarily from those that are atheists who are arguing that there is no God at all. So the question then becomes, well, are we all looking at the right thing? So that's where we want to start from. We are starting from science and Christianity. So let's go to the basic roots of it. We would like to look, like to look at a definition. I looked around and research tells me that the, one of the most reliable English dictionaries we have is the Oxford English Dictionary. So that's the one I went to. And in the Oxford English Dictionary, science is defined as the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. I'll say that again. Science is the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. And on the other side, Christianity is defined in the same dictionary as the religion based on the person and teachings of Jesus Christ or its beliefs and practices thereof. So what do we observe from these definitions? I think the first thing that jumps out at us on science is the fact that it is a study of the physical and the natural world, which means science is great at explaining the things that we see, the world in which we are, because they are physical and they are natural. But if you haven't already figured that out, you would realize that there are also lots of things in this world and beyond that are not physical and natural. And anybody who knows anything about science will make no assertions about science being able to explain those things. So the first thing to think of is, why would we ask science to explain God when God is neither physical nor natural? And that's where the discussion effectively breaks down in most conversations, because that's what is classically called a category mistake. You can't ask science to explain something that it is not designed to explain. But there is a little bit more, because we need to really delve into where, where, does, where does this really take us? If science can't explain good or evil, it can't explain feelings. So for instance, my lovely wife here, Sheila and I, have been married for 11 years. She tells me often that she loves me. But can I scientifically prove that to you? I would challenge you to try to see how I do that. And the reason is, the way we would be able to verify something like that is through trust, the person's own testimony, behavior, and other things along those lines. And by the way, I've run that test on her, and she passed, so don't worry. We are good, okay? But the question then becomes, if indeed that is the issue of science, then where do we go from here? Typically, when the world says, prove this to me, they don't really mean ultimate proof. Because in most times in this world, a lot of things, including science, are based on trust. So, the word faith has a spiritual meaning, as we see in the Bible, but the word faith is also the same word in English that sometimes is called trust. So there are other uses of that word. So we would use trust for the sake of uh, not getting mixed up. But if we look at trust, science also uses trust to advance a lot of its processes. And so does most things that we do in life. So if we are going to use that, how is that then going to help us to resolve an issue like this? Uh, there's a school I went to that happened to be very known for engineering. I didn't study engineering, I studied business, but they found a way to permeate engineering into everything that that school did, including those of us that were doing business. And the one thing that became very clear to me when you encounter rigorous mathematics is that that is the only way for ultimate proof. So anybody who does math here knows that if you are told to prove something, 
you can take it to an ultimate destination. A destination that can, after that, be unresolvable, right? Now, to the point that we were making earlier, when the world generally says, prove this to me, that is not the ultimate proof they are referring to. They are referring to, how can I feel comfortable about this? How can I really agree with you about this? Uh, but science primarily breaks down the basic block of science. Most equations in science break down into a mathematical equation. So if science is going to have to use math, then it is clear that it is a category mistake and we cannot use science to explain anything about God or Christianity for that matter uh, or Christ because all these things are fundamentally embedded in the spiritual world. Now, what does that then say about Christianity also? So, well, what does Christianity then say in some ways about science if we reflect the lens the other way around? Well, in it's, it's some ways it's equal because Christianity, again, is presented, and the Bible, which is the primary document that helps us to position that message, does not set itself up as a scientific document. The Bible is a document of faith. It's a document of word from the Lord to his people to guide us in terms of how to live our lives. Now, if you've spent some time in the Bible, I would imagine you know by now that there probably are some scientific facts in the Bible. Actually, there are, there are quite a lot. We will only look at three this morning because the point we are trying to establish is that the Bible may have some scientific facts, but it is not a science textbook. So it isn't the place we will go to to resolve a scientific question to an ultimate destination. And let's see a few reasons why. The first one is in Job chapter 26. So in Job 26, Job is talking about God's majesty and how unsearchable are his ways, you know, when he went on on this prologue. And in verse 7, he says, He stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth on nothing. He hangs the earth on nothing. This is in Job 26, verse 7. This is the first written account of what we know today of the earth having free float in space. Today, we take it for granted that we look at these pictures of planets and everything is suspending, you know, somehow. And you know, we kind of don't know where it came from. But scripture attests to this. And it really never was mentioned in science or discovered until some 3,000 years later in 1650. So the Bible does mention some of these things, but it just moves on and deals with the other things that the, the Bible is seeking to tell uh, all of us, which is God's people. A second thing to note, scientific fact, is in Isaiah 40, verse 22, where the Bible talks about the spherical nature of the world. For many years, and you would know if you've read some Christian history that there's some historic Christian trends that believe that Christians were the ones who were propagating the message that the world was flat. But the Bible does say in Isaiah 40, 40 verse 22 that it is he who sits above the circle of the earth. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. Now, you look at a few translations of what that word circle means, and it basically talks about it being rounded, what we would today consider spherical, which, again, is another reference to what we now know and take for granted about what the world is. This was eventually discovered by Aristotle some 300 years later. The last one that I would mention, and that's not all of it, there is many more, is in the book of Leviticus. In the book of Leviticus, the Bible gives us a few things more along the medical uh, path. So there are two things that we will refer to here. Washing of hands with running water and the periods or the rules around quarantine. Well, why is this? You know, I've had conversations where sometimes even I am marveled, and others are as well, how the people of God, Israelites and beyond, managed to survive some of the plagues, the infections, of that time without the modern you know, 
advancements of science we know today, healthcare, you know, disease, medicines, all that. Well, it's because they had some very specific rules around how to manage these things. So Leviticus chapter 15, verse 13 says this, And when he who has a discharge is cleansed of his discharge, then he shall count himself seven days for his cleansing, wash his clothes, and bathe his body in running water, and then he shall be clean. By the way, this is in New King James. Just so you know, if you read any other translation outside of the King James or the New King James, you will find a reference to fresh water instead of running water. But you get the message. Then the other one is in Leviticus 13, verse 46, which says, He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. These practices were not adopted formally in science until the very early 20th century. There are records of massive losses of lives because we were not practicing some of these things that were right there from the beginnings of the Bible. Well, that even reminds us of an infectious disease we are dealing with today. You know, thanks to Omega, we will be talking more about coronavirus later today. But it just reminds us of the fact that these mechanisms are not new. They are the same old tenets that we just adhere to. And if we are disciplined in practicing them, we help the rules work. So if, if I can add my voice to what Omega is most likely to say, uh, the one thing I have found to be most effective is wash your hands with running water. And I believe the WHO, uh, WHO says for 20 seconds. Now, Try and test that and see how long you can keep your hands under running water. That's what it takes to make sure that we practice the hygiene to keep ourselves safe. There are many more scientific facts in the Bible. In fact, the one that I think may intrigue a lot of people when we talk about science is, you know, dinosaurs, especially with the younger ones around, amongst us. We don't have time to get into that or else we will be here till, you know, later today. But I would encourage you to look particularly um, at Job 40. Some interesting things, some interesting things you would see, um, which I won't get to, but it starts to give a sense of what some of the biblical views are around things like that. And, and obviously there is references back to creation. But these are the points around some facts that the Bible talks about that are scientific in nature. Most of the earliest scientists that are known are either people that believed passionately in God or were out-and-out out Christians. And a lot of these things drove them to their further advancements in the experiments and the science that they actually practiced. What does that actually do for us then? If we know all of this, do we then are able to use it in a proper way? Well, the question is, how do we use the Bible as it, refers, as it relates to science? Do we also make what I would think is a mistake of looking at the, the Bible as a scientific textbook? Because imagine these points that we mentioned. The Bible just mentions it and it moves on. The Bible didn't take time to define what it was talking about. It didn't take time to unpack it, you know, give us all sorts of practices and applications of how we could find and use these things. The same way you would probably see time spent on faith in Hebrews 11. You know, time spent on love in 1 Corinthians 13. You don't see that around some of the scientific facts. That tells us the focus that the Lord has in the Bible that has been given to us. So why would we then want to make the Bible something that it is not? So as great as it is in communicating some scientific messages, we also don't want to get to the point where we are getting into arguments where we are trying to make the Bible say what it hasn't said. A lot of this sometimes comes out of Genesis 1 and 2, but that is a whole different conversation. So from these observations, what can we say? We can say that, look, indeed, laws of nature scientific facts mentioned in the Bible, all these things are just observations. We haven't 
uncovered anything that wasn't already there. And we haven't said anything that clearly the God that you and I know didn't already know or hasn't already purposed to be there. Isaac Newton is reputed in, among scientists to be probably the brightest scientist that ever lived. I don't know what your view might be. But he is one of the people that discovered or developed the law of gravity. One of the things he wrote, and if you didn't know, Isaac Newton is believed to, well, he's recorded as saying he believes in God, but he wasn't an out-and-out -out Christian because he had issues with uh, the divinity of Christ. However, he wrote more about what we would call theology of the things of God than he did about physics, which was his area. He was a genius. But he wrote that the reason he believes in God is through his scientific discoveries, in particular, the law of gravity. Well, why do I mention that fact? Because it also reminds us that there are people who hold the opposite view. And the one that I would mention, because he's so popular, is the late Dr. Stephen Hawking. In fact, Stephen Hawking died a year exactly yesterday. And he's famous, well, not just probably because of his physical condition, because of his ailment that he lived with for many decades, but he said that he does not believe that God exists because of the law of gravity. It tells you the kind of disagreements even the most intelligent people have around using science to interpret God. And so the point is, why would we try to continue to enforce this category mistake? In fact, there are people who believe that Hawking's misunderstanding is probably because he was thinking of a different God. Yeah. You can look that up and see what you think about that. Uh, one of the people who uh, you know, positioned that argument is um, a professor of mathematics, Dr. John Lennox, uh, at the Oxford University who tries to argue that point. There are many scientists that have different view, but you, you see where we're going, that if you are going to use science to explain God, it's hard to get to a destination that everybody agrees with, because it can't be used to do that. So it's good to know that there are many believing scientists, but it doesn't really answer the question for us. You know, Dr. John Lennox is one of them. In fact, there are many that I wouldn't bother to list because I think most of you might know some of them. But the fact that there are very good scientists that believe in God and are Christians, does that prove that God exists? Well, not really. It probably helps us strengthen our argument that science and God cannot be incompatible, which I, would, I think is a fair argument because if these people are probably the best and the brightest in that subject, how could they possibly live as experts in their fields and still believe that God exists? So at least the two things are not incompatible. But it cannot be seen as a proof, positive, that God definitely exists. Well, if we know this, then indeed we ask ourselves, what does that tell us about how we observe the world, how we observe and we interpret God? Scientists look at things, and they use those observations to come to conclusions. You know, so there are many wonderful observations and, and discoveries that have been done. I talked about the law of gravity, energy, electromagnetic, many of them. But if you delve a little bit deeper, you realize that the laws are laws that describe these various things. So there is a law describing the law of energy, describing the law of motion, it does not attempt to explain how that energy came about, because it can't. What science has done is help us explain the world that we are in. And we continue to discover new things every single day. So if you ask or you look through that lens, you ask yourself, if you found an excellent art and you start to appreciate that art more and more, you only admire the genius of the artist behind it, you know, whether it's the great ones like Picasso or, or somebody else. Same thing in any other field. Well, why wouldn't we do the same thing for the universe? 
you know, the little piece of that universe that we live in that we call the world, that if we observe it closely and we ask ourselves, it is intricate in its inmost sense. And we can get into more detail on, on some of those intricacies and complexities and the amazing way that the Lord has made the universe. Well, why wouldn't that lead us to say that there is an amazing person behind the making of that universe? But rather the opposite, which is what a lot in the world, particularly the atheist community, are trying to convince us to do. And this is the argument for what is commonly called intelligent design. Is there somebody really behind it? One example that came to mind, because I've always been fascinated by the Hopak entrance garden, you know, for those who come here every day, you probably take it for granted. But when you enter, right at the front, there is a beautiful garden that spells the name of the school. I always ask myself, who has the time to sit and design and craft that hedge in such a way that it tells us the beautiful message of the name of the school. Would it be fair for us to say that, yeah, that just happened by itself? You know, you just leave it there and the grass sort of finds a way to organize itself and it looks the way it does. Well, that, that seems a little bit ridiculous, right? So if we apply that same concept to every natural argument in the world, why would we not apply that same argument or observation to the world? The world in every layer that you look at is not random, and we will look at some of that. So why would we not say that there is somebody behind placing everything where it is so that it doesn't become chaos? So that's primarily what we learn from these things. So now we know that science cannot disprove God because it's not the same category, and we know that the Bible and Christianity in general is not out to disprove science or explain it for that matter because that's not the primary goal of it. But the question is, for all these things that scientists are telling us, gives us the point, the message that the more you observe even what is around us, the physical world that we are in, the more you appreciate the wonder and the amazement of God. The more you study it, in fact, there are lots of famous scientists who became Christians as part of their scientific study. They weren't before. Well, how does that look like for us? We look at a few examples. One is called the missing links in the evolutionary cycle. You know, they are called intermediate varieties because the very common point when we talk about this argument between science and God is obviously the argument of creation. When we get to the whole point of design, the question is, is it, you know, Big Bang or is it, you know, we evolved from, you know, some primates and from other things? Well, which is it? And when we say evolution here, we mean the classic form of evolution, which is, you know, obviously, uh, you know, taught by the, uh, the father of this, which is Charles Darwin, you have to realize that today, evolution is used in many different ways. You know, there are even uh, theistic evolutionary messages. You know, Christians have found a bit of a hybrid where you, know, you can be told about an evolutionary cycle with some imprints of God in it. Uh, that's a whole new dimension of thinking. But when we say evolution in our conversation this morning, we are talking the classic godless evolution, which is what Dar Darwin proposed. In that cycle, you would think that we'll go from fish to primate to, you know, the earlier forms of human to what we are today, which is Homo sapiens. But scientific records show all these geological findings that we actually haven't been able to find these step-by-step -step progressions in the fossil record. So Darwin himself made a statement, and I'll read it to you, in his book uh, on the subject. And he admitted that this was a bit of a challenge to his theory. He says, the number of intermediate varieties which, are form which formerly existed on Earth must be truly enormous. Why then is not every geological formation full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chains, and this perhaps 
is the most obvious and gravest objection which can be argued against my theory. So even he admitted, and this is actually, I would say, one of the things I like about scientists is they are very objective for the most part. If they have a theory, they always tell you what the back door to that theory is. Um, so if you read a scientific book, read all of it. In fact, Stephen Hawking's book is known to be the bestseller that is most unread, if you didn't know that, because it is an extremely complex book, the origin of speeches. So people buy it. I think it sold like 25 million copies, but apparently they couldn't read it. They get to the first few pages and they give up. But if you're going to read a scientific book, read it entirely because you will see the arguments well presented. They tend to be logical, including the weakness of their own arguments presented in their own documents. Now, why is this important for us? The missing links are a challenge to the classic evolutionary story that Darwin proposes. But that falls perfectly within the lap of the creation God that we know, we talk about. Because our God is not tied to having to make things sequential, is he? Right? In his awesome, amazing, sovereign state of being able to speak things into existence, he can skip any stages that he wants. So that points more to probably a creation more state of things coming into being versus the slow evolutionary step-by-step -step process which the world is trying to make us believe. Another one is a simple point around the type of system that we are in, closed systems, which you know, in scientific parlance, it's called the law of entropy. A closed system is an argument that says that the universe, like any other natural thing, tends to move from a process of order to chaos over time without any attention paid to it, which is part of the argument I was making later, I was making earlier. You know, typically, if you think about, you know, if you have a child in your house or something, your family, you know that without a parent's intervention, a child's room will go from orderly to very messy in a very short time. And that's what happens to most things in life, is without focus, order, some injection from outside to keep it on track, it's almost impossible for those things to stay orderly. There are lots of things said about this by various scientists, and in the interest of time, we will move on. But one that particularly resonates is, if you really came across an argument like this, why would you rather take the position of no intervention? Because in the natural part of life, we would say that is a normal process. But the world or this life that we know has so much order in it, you know, think about a few things. The position of our galaxy, how many other stars there are, the millions, billions, we are told by scientists, positions, electromagnetic force, laws of gravity, energy, distances between the sun, the moon, all the things that scientists tell us that if things shifted by a little bit, we will all just blow up like poop because we can't handle either the heat from the sun or we end up in no man's land and end up crashing into Mars, something like that will happen. So who is holding all those pieces together? And you would tell me that you would rather believe that this is happening out of nothing rather than somebody intricately, intentionally holding it together for the good of all people. The next point that we will look at fairly quickly is the very well-known scientific basic building block, which is the DNA. Now, this is believed to be the most basic building block, it's a molecule, of the body. And it's sort of like the, you know, the chief. It tells everyone what to do. So the DNA is what decides what color of hair you're gonna have, what kind of tissue you will have, it gives orders to every muscle, do this, do that. Now, the DNA is also considered a code. In fact, that's what scientists call it. They call it the code of the DNA. And a code is effectively a language. If you think of how coding and technology works, it's a language. And all languages originate from somewhere. If you came to Tanzania and you 
all of a sudden encountered Swahili, would you say that Swahili just came to existence? You know, we just started speaking it because it sounded nice. We all believe that language information always originates from somewhere. Somebody has to design it, shape it, and help others to pick it up and develop it. Another argument for the fact that the DNA that is the basic building block of biology couldn't have come into being by itself. It had to be put there um, by someone. In fact, one of the a famous German engineer said that there is no known law of nature or no known process which can cause information to originate by itself in matter. So if that's the case, and the scientists are saying this, then why are they the same people, at least certain camps of them, trying to convince us that everything that we know and believe came out of nothing? Well, incredibly, I would say that this is where we need to be careful about what we listen to and what we take in around this particular conversation. There is a lot to be said around it, but if we continue to go on this path, we will be here till tomorrow. I think you want to spend more time with me, don't you? But we need to land, right? Which is find a destination of exactly what this tells us as Christians. So the DNA is also known to be probably the most complex molecule uh, in the body. And its complexity is beyond measure. You know, uh, a few scientists have written about this, and the one that I would quote is E.C. Comfield. He's a Nobel laureate uh, in molecular biology. He says, while laboring among the intricacies and definitive, definitive minute particles in a laboratory, I frequently have been overwhelmed by a sense of infinite wisdom of God. One is rather amazed that a mechanism of such intricacy could ever function properly at all. The simplest man-made mechanisms require a planner, a maker. How a mechanism 10 times more involved and intricate can be conceived as self-constructed and self-developed is completely beyond me. This is a Nobel laureate that is trying to say that this argument couldn't possibly make sense. I would tend to agree, because the next point, which is trying to put all the arguments we've made until now, mathematically, is trying to see, okay, fine, let's solve for probability of any of these things happening, and ask ourselves, how really probable is it? And you have to realize that this is actually very similar to the argument that you know, Mark used in the very first sermon in this series about how we can trust the Bible. It's, it's all about all the information available to us and how probable all these things can be from the information we have to be able to perform some sort of proof or evidence in science. So a particularly well-known mathematician, he's actually a very good friend, wrote most of the books as a co-writer with uh, Stephen Hawking. He's, uh, he's called Roger Penrose. So clearly, the more time he spends around Hawking and doing all these writings and making these arguments, he had to en delve and encounter, you know, really deal with this particular message around science and God. And whether things came into existence, which is Hawking's primary hypothesis, that it came out of nothing, he said, well, let's run some probabilities. And the basic conclusion of his point was, for all of these things that we spoke about, everything to work out of nothing the probability has to be 1 divided by 10 to the power 10,123. Take a moment and reflect on that. You know, I think the kids here who are in grade 1 and 2 know a little bit about fractions. It's 1 divided by 10,123. In fact, if you try to run... What did I say? I said it's 10, it's 10 to the power, 10,123. Not sure if I said that right the first time. Which is, if you wrote that 10,000 to the power, 10,123 out in full, it will be 10 
with 10,123 zeros after it, right? In mathematical circles, 10, 1 divided by 10 to the power of 50 is effective zero, which is zero probability. Now we are talking 10 to the power of 50 versus 10 to the power 10,123, which is closer to zero to you. And this is somebody who has spent his life studying this fact with probably one of the biggest authorities on this subject. He says it is not probable for all that we see and know to come out of nothing. Now, so with all these things, we say that, look, there are all these odds against us. So why is there so much antagonism? you know, fight, you know, trying to chase us around with this. And to the point where I think most of you will know that this conversation, when it arises, especially in secular circles, is not about who is right or wrong. It's generally reduced to the level of who is smart or stupid. And that is why most of us shy away from that conversation. Because we don't want to be put in that bucket. But I'm here to tell you today that there is lots of evidence that supports the position that we believe in. Because the attempt to use science to make this argument is, like we said before, it's a non-starter. It's, it's a wrong category, it doesn't make sense, and so why the world pushes it so much and it gets so much support should tell us the agenda in the social circles as a whole. So look, we have to recognize that the enemy is at work in these things, um, and we have to be mindful of how we respond to some of these things. We also have to be mindful that the world is really pushing this message, like many other secular messages that we are aware of. Think of the things that are being pushed into school curriculums these days or other uh, facets of life. You know, if, to the point that I made, Hawking's book sold 25 million copies like that, you know, let any other of the theologians and the apologists that I mentioned, whether it's John Lennox or others, um, write something and ask how many networks or will run the actual message, the story, the book. It's not the same. And so you have to recognize that don't use the amount of coverage there is on a particular subject or topic to conclude in its legitimacy. That's a very important point, especially around Christian arguments with worldly views. The other thing is accepting that God existing means lots of people need to change things in their lives, and it's inconvenient. Imagine all these people, the kind of lives, the choices they make, and they obviously know about the Christian world because they study it in order to make these arguments, and they are not willing to make those concessions. Well, what does this mean to all of us? The first challenge is a research study. So a Banner research group in 2017, not very long ago, ran a study on professing Christians. And it said that only 17% of professing Christians hold a biblical worldview. What does that mean? It means that if you were asked to explain any of these things we talked about today, you know, your understanding of how the world came about, um, other topics, that have both worldly and biblical connotations, which side would be your primary destination? Only 17% had their view, which is their worldview, based out of Scripture. That is a very dangerous place for us to be. My question to you today, if you just think very quickly and run a self-diagnostic, is which part are you in? Are you in the 17 or you are in the 83? And that, I think, is the primary challenge that is presented to us in this particular topic that we are discussing today. So I've only just finished point number one. We have five more to go, so I hope you are with me, right? Coming to a close. The Christian faith thunders about how great God is, his purpose, all these things that are important to us. One thing that we realize that what these definitions of what science is trying to say 
also have a, a connotation. What they are saying is that there is no God, obviously, but what that no God message is saying is also that we are meaningless, you know, there is no plan, you know, you came out of nothing, there's no real intention, you're not special. But what does the Bible tell us around this, right? So I'll very quickly point you to one. King David, who's a great writer on this, in Psalm 139, said this in a few verses. Verse 13, you formed me, my inmost parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Verse 15 to 17, my frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret. Intricately woven, you wrote in your book, every one of my days before then came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. It's one of the reasons we all love David, is how intimate he was with God when he wrote. But if he's saying that God knitted us, he made us, he thought about us long before we came into being, well then, how would I believe that the world telling me I am random, I am unwanted, I came by chance out of nothing? You have to realize that this is one of the reasons the most intelligent people in the world today are suffering from, you know, we are talking case of suicide, you know, extreme depression, because they run into a wall and can no longer resolve how to answer those questions. So where we stand is actually what scripture proposes. And there is science to show that it actually leads to some good destinations for us. Research shows that Religious people, you know, Christians for that matter, on average, have a longer life. We live seven to ten years longer. So you have an incentive to love God, I'm telling you, right? We live seven to ten years longer. We have better emotional intelligence. We have better calm in how we deal with situations. And obviously, it means you are a better, well-rounded person. That, for me, is proof in the pudding of where we want to go. But as we leave, the question then is, how do we use this for our benefit? First thing is, don't let anybody let you think that your view is stupid or not intelligent. Because as we have argued, this is not the case, and there are facts to support that. Secondly, you have to get clear with some information to support your position on this point around the fact that science can't actually disprove God. So I've hopefully given you enough information this morning to give you a bit of a toolkit, but there is a wealth of information out there about this. I would encourage you to dive into it because this is a conversation that will only get more heated as the years go by. Because the world is on an agenda, if you haven't realized, to try to break us all down so that we don't present this message that they find uncomfortable. So the onus is on us to get better prepared. So I'd encourage you, study this a bit more. If you need some resources, I'm happy to talk, and the elders will help you uh, find some good places to go. Third is love God with your mind. What we mean there is challenge yourself a little bit more. Christians, even if you go back to the whole 17% uh, statistic, have been known to be largely unintellectual. That is a problem. That unintellectuality leads to most Christians not actually reading their Bible the way they should. Uh, it's, it's too big. I would rather read the comic books that are like three pages. You know, this book that is, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages. You know, some people start and they get stuck. But invariably, we don't delve into what Scripture recommends and advises us to do. So let's do a bit more there. And we have to realize that there is a warning in all of this. Can I encourage you to take out your Bible, to read one Scripture as we come to a close? And it's in Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, I will read from 19 to 23, it says... For what can be known of God, about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. 
so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise. They became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, animals, and creeping things. That sounds very much like the scientific people, no? Claiming to be wise, they actually became fools. But you have to realize that Scripture is very emphatic. We are without excuse because the Lord is knocking at our door through creation. To some of the observations that I just pointed out to you, spend a bit more time in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Ask yourself, how did these things really evolve? Like I said, there's a bit more there that I can't get into today, but there's a belief, you know, old earth, new earth, or young earth. All that leads to what do we think God was packing in there that we could take out of it for our benefit? Have we taken time to look at this? There is a warning, so we need to make sure that we are prepared for it. And let us use what is in Scripture to fuel our worship. The more you read, the more you marvel. The more you see what is in Scripture, to the points we talked about, the number of you know, galaxies, you know, all these things that we see, we know that God is great. And he made all these things. He made the stars, you know, we are told in Genesis 1. He made the heavens. He made the earth. So if he did all these things, then how does then that not lead to us worshiping even more? My encouragement to you, if you haven't realized, is this is stuff that you cannot learn all by yourself. Most of us will never become experts on this subject. The people who argue this very much are called Christian apologists. You know, you and I may not become one of those. But we have ourselves to learn from. Somebody sitting right next to you may be better equipped in this subject than you are. And that's why I echo what, you know, Jeremy had told us before about life groups. So let me plug life groups before I end that this is one of the most important ways that we can learn together. Complement what we are learning ourselves with what others can share with us. Find a community that you can study with. If you don't have one or you don't know where to go, please speak to me. We will help out with that. But this is one of the best ways we can prepare ourselves for what is coming. And we have to realize that all this is for a good purpose. 1 Peter 3.15 says we need to have a response, right? for the hope that we have. When people ask, we need to be able to say something. In fact, even when they don't ask out of evangelistic love, we should tell them anyway, right? But to do that, we have to have what it takes to be able to do that. My encouragement to all of us is let's use this well. I think we've done a lot in these past seven weeks to try to answer these questions. You have to realize that it is not exhaustive. So we are not leaving with the impression that we've answered all your questions. So you can go home now right? But we've given ourselves, I think, enough information to get ourselves excited to what is next in this particular discussion. So feel free to use the resources available in the church to advance these subjects, but we look forward uh, to doing all these together. Thank you, and God bless you. Let's pray. Our dear Lord, we thank you for being a great and amazing God. We thank you that we can believe squarely in Scripture that you are the Lord that made the heavens and the earth. We thank you that we can see your power, your amazing nature in every facet of life around us, even in our own intricately, intricately made bodies. We pray that this observation, this truth, will sit well in our hearts and we will even be able to hold on better to it that we might be able to use it to fuel our own worship of you, to stand firm in you, and also to be able to advance your word even into the world. We bless you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen.